been asked to uh, briefly discuss black holes, a bit of what they are and what, what they're about. Um, we don't understand everything about black holes, but we're pretty sure they exist. And the definition of a black hole is basically any object that has an escape velocity greater than the speed of light. So if light was close to the black hole, light could not escape. So we would call that black, right? Um, so the, but there's a lot of other strange effects that happen around uh, an object that's got so much gravity that light can't escape from it. And these are things that uh, Einstein's theories of relativity have helped, uh, helped us uh, understand. Some of the weird things that go on is that if you uh, drop something into a black hole, as it approaches what we call the event horizon, the event horizon is precisely where light stops escaping from the black hole. The black hole could, itself could be a really tiny little point in the middle, but it's got this region around it where light can't escape, and we call that whole region the black hole, even though it's a concentration in the center. But uh, we see time slow down. If you drop something in, you would see it slow down and, and freeze when it hits the surface the, of the event horizon. If uh, it had a particular color to it, we would see that color shift through the spectrum toward the red end of the spectrum uh, in a rainbow. Um, the red's on one end, blue's on the other, and drop the blue object in. As it slowed down hitting the event horizon, you would see it shift through the color to the rainbow, okay. and eventually beyond what your human eye could see into radio waves. So that's called uh, gravitational redshift. These are things verified uh, from, from uh, experiment. Um, around black holes that mass something like uh, our own sun, um, generally speaking, if you were falling into that, uh, there's something called tidal forces. Tidal forces <coughs> cause the tides here on Earth, and they're an effect of gravity being dependent upon distance so that uh, gravity pulls stronger on the close side of something than on the far side. And the gravitational field around a black hole is so intense that it would just basically stretch and rip apart anything falling into it. So these are all strange, weird things that are associated with, with known physics and uh, very likely with, with black holes. And from an astronomy point of view, uh, we have very good evidence that black holes are real. Uh, both black holes that are similar in mass to stars. Uh, we see objects in binary star systems where one's a bright star and the other one, we can't see it, but we know it's extremely massive. And we also have evidence for black holes at the centers of galaxies, which can be as much as a billion times the mass of our own sun. So there's just my brief intro on some of the facts about black holes. We, we think massive stars and supernova explosions can turn into black holes. The supermassive one at the center of galaxies, we don't know exactly how they form, but maybe from the merger of smaller black holes. Okay, another question. Actually, I have not so much a question, but an observation, and Susan and others may want to comment on this. Chris Burry, who is doing an art piece in July at the um, museum um, in Laramie, happens to be an artist that actually bridges in some ways the topics of both of the other two presenters here. He um, not only works with natural objects, um, such as a mushroom, and using document some of the patterns in um, our, our natural world around us, and he incorporates them into the artwork, as well as goes back into the history, in particular Native American history, he's done basket weaving, um, based on some of the patterns and the histories of Native Americans. Um, and so I think it's, when we talk about, I was thinking about the, your comment in film, how science can be twisted and not be accurate, all for theatrics. There is art you can also manipulate that way, but it, there's also art that is um, pretty accurate. And I think Chris Drury is one of those artists that can take some of the beauty of history as well as science and incorporate it into his art. To, to Susan, did you have any comments on that? Um, I would, about Chris, um, when 
when Chris was here um, in Laramie to do his site visit, uh, we had him meet with the um, graduate students in the uh, School of um, uh, um, Environment and Natural Resources. And he also met with Jeff Lockwood and with some other faculty members. So actually meeting with some of our um, science slash natural history based faculty and students to begin to talk about what is what was specific to Wyoming or our region um, in order to come up with the idea of the materials for the work he's going to do for us. Now the piece itself, the spiral form um, that I showed you that looked like a floating disc on that screen, um, that if you if you look at his reference drawings, he's looking at mushroom spores. He talks about the macro and the micro. So he's looking at things that are big and very small. So the, the um, looking at the footprint of that circular form, he references mushroom spores. He talks about twisting it into a vortex, which is what this piece will look like. It's um, larger at the outside. There'll be illusion of it disappearing in the middle, kind of like a black hole. And um, and the other thing that he talked about with the vortex form, uh, he talked about how, how um, blood g runs through your heart and there's a vortex <coughs> in your heart. So he's picking up all of these very interesting kinds of um, knowledge to, it, to in integrate into his artwork. Now the, um, the coal, of course, and, and uh, disintegrating wood, which becomes coal eventually, is a whole thing about the cycle of um, natural forces and recycling, so. But that, that's a really interesting observation, Sue. Thank you. Um, Dr. Beans or Jeff Beans? Yes. Um, you mentioned that the approximate population of the Lakota was 25 to 50,000 in the 1850s. I'd be curious, what is it currently? And then the second part, what is, you know, there's approximately 300 million Americans. Of that, what is the approximate population of the entire Indian nation? Okay, the questions are uh, population of the Lakota today and then the entire uh, Indian population today. Um, I can uh, estimate for the uh, Lakota, it's somewhere between 225 and 275,000, and that's including, though, uh, the Minnesota, Dakota, the Nakota, or Yankton, Yankton A and uh, all of the Laco seven tribes of the Lakota Nation uh, throughout North Dakota and South Dakota. At Pine Ridge, uh, there's 26,000 Oglala on Pine Ridge at, uh, right now. Um, over the entire the United States, uh, I, and, and what's interesting is every tribe defines its membership. It's allowed to now, so they do. Um, and for my tribe, it's 25%. You have to be at least one quarter blood quantum to be a tribal member, whereas the Cherokee, all you need to do is show descendancy uh, from the Dawes roll. So you could be one 362nd, but if you're <coughs> direct descendants, you can get in. So uh, the Cherokee <laughs> overly inflate their numbers. Uh, but uh, <laughs> there's a lot more of them. Uh, Navajo are also very large. I, uh, somewhere between probably 5 and 10 million, uh, but I'm not even positive on that uh, across the entire United States. It's a, it's a very small percentage. Like you know, 1% or just a hair under 1%. Uh, yeah. Just for Jeff Beans also, I'm not sure what kind of question it is. It's sort of a cultural, social question. I just want kind of your opinion on it. it I think it's amazing to me how, <clears throat> as a culture, a society, we will take a person who, say, President Obama, who is just as much white as he is black, and yet, we always label the person by the minority, even if a person is a fourth of something. As a society, we label them that way, often to take that identity or she. And I want to know, is that true worldwide, do you think? And what is that about? Why is it that we, that we always label someone as a minority? Maybe that's a harder path for them to walk, and they're sort of forced to walk that path. Um, yeah, the question is on uh, racial identification and why we tend to, uh, as a nation, focus on the minorities rather than the, the majority. Um, yeah, t I think technically I'm right around 33% Oglala, but that means I'm 67%, well, Irish slash everything else. Um, yeah, the old joke is that means I want a drink, I just can't handle it. 
Um, <laughs> bad joke. Anyway, um, th you know, there's we could have a, uh, an entire semester. Forget a Saturday university on on that. The reasons for that, um, and a lot of it has to do with. Um, colonization as Western culture began to expand around the world and came into contact with all these strange and exotic people of different shades, um, one of the easiest ways for them and one of the first things they always used to describe these other people was their color. And so therefore race became a social construct that became a very clear identifier and also because most of these cultures were hierarchical, stru structured uh, in class and these kinds of things. Um, it was very easy then to place those people of darker skin at the bottom. Uh, in fact, there's, you know, Linnaeus's charts and everything else that clearly show that, you know, if you're going to do a chart of humans, well, you start with the Aryan race and so on, and then you go down toward the bottom for the blacks. Um, and so as it's an identifier, the reason that we, uh, they, those t they tend to be identified more quickly with the minority is because culturally and historically it's been an identifier in a negative context. It, it's... It's something that we can point to and say, aha, you're, you know, it, now that's changing very dramatically just in, you know, our own lifetime. Um, but it had always historically been very clearly, you know, something that uh, identified you and separated you. So even if you were, you know, especially in the South, like one-tenth black, oh, well, you know, then they'd talk about you and, you know, and so on and so forth. Same within the West with Indians and so on. Um, there was always that kind of shading to it. So it's, it's, just a, it's just a way that as a society we define ourselves and we can then look at somebody else and, and instead of getting to know them, just sit, oh, okay, you're Indian, therefore I, I know as enough about you as I need to. Could I just say in the interest of scientific literacy that nobody can be one-third Indian or one-tenth black, it has to be a power of two? <laughs> it's... <laughs> I, I, you know, it's really not important. It's just a movie. Uh, <laughs> um, it, this is, it's, it's like somebody that's three quarter marries somebody that's one quarter that, or, or uh, somehow you get into the, you know, the thirds or it, it's, it, there's, it's insanity. And it started when the government decided that it was going to start quantifying Indians by blood quantum. And all of a sudden, you know, what happens if you marry somebody that's a, a, a fraction that doesn't easily go into another fraction and it, it gets insanity. I just round that around. I have absolutely no idea, but I've just, my dad says he's about two-thirds, so I just round down. <laughs> <laughs> just. Yeah. Uh, this is for Mike. Uh, what do you think about the way black holes are portrayed in the center? Well, uh, black holes are popular because they're weird and extreme and, uh, scary. and scary. And, you know, it's, it's kind of like with people being exposed to uh, the vacuum of space. Um, some of the stuff gets black holes right, and some of the stuff is just like, really? They're talking about black holes? Um, do, you, do you think of something that get right wrong? Like you uh, I can think of more examples, I think, from, from TV. There was a, a really horrible <laughs> sci-fi movie where a black hole was in St. Louis sucking it up. And <laughs> somehow, somehow there was some electrical monster associated with the black hole. I, I don't know how or why, <laughs> but it was totally bizarre. Um, then there's been some TV shows like uh, Stargate. Um, Stargate had a black hole episode. They got, got at least parts of it right. Um, and, and that was nice to see. They got some of the time dilation effects right. They got, uh, it, was, it was interesting and, and parts of it were well done. So it's, it's getting out there, but there's still strange and sometimes you just can't say words after you've given a talk. Uh, Enigmatic <laughs> objects, maybe quixotic even. Um, uh, this uh, is a very cheeky question. But how the heck do you do experiments on black holes? Um, you know, that's a, maybe a good general question for the science of astronomy itself. Um, and there's some other fields like, like paleontology that are like this that are observational sciences where it's, it's difficult or impossible to do a classic experiment where you set something up and, and do it. Um, 
there are some experimental astrophysics, but the way we tend to go about doing things is uh, more like sociology. We go get a sample of objects in some demographic, and then we look at their properties, and we try to understand those properties in terms of fundamental physics, and then we develop a theory from that, and it lets us make predictions about other properties they might have. And so then we're, the experiment at that point is going out and doing the observation to see if they have these other properties they should have according to our theory or not. So that's sort of the sense of, of observational experiment in a field like astronomy. And with, with black holes, um, you know, we might make certain predictions about how they should grow in galaxies over time or, um, you know, and then we can go look at those galaxies and see if the predictions hold up. So it's a little bit indirect, but uh, we seem to make progress that way. Um, that means there's a, a local river here, you know, the Gobant River. I think it's a French trapper term for Big Belly. Or, um, and there's a lot of things called the Gobants in this area. Is that tribe still in existence? In the river? Yes. Yeah, a uh, question on the Grovant, are they still around? Yes, they're, uh, they're still around. They were actually, um, I think they're on two or three different reservations. Uh, and a lot of, uh, when the you, United you know, States government was moving people around, they decided that it, instead of giving each tribe their own land, it'd be easier just to shove them all on one, which is why you have the Shoshone and Arapaho, two traditional enemies, uh, together. Um, good idea. They, it's worse in California. There's a dozen tribes in some reservations there, but I can't, I can't remember, but Montana, definitely, <coughs> and I think North Dakota, there, there's a population there as well, so. Uh, <coughs> Jeff, I wonder if, uh, if you'd comment on the, the role of uh, reservations in the contemporary American Indian community. Oh boy, don't get me started. Um, uh, the contemporary uh, reservations, or what is the role of reservations in contemporary society? Um, reservations were originally designed to be temporary. Uh, it was assumed that Native Americans would either become extinct or assimilate. Uh, and gosh darn it, we didn't. Uh, we held on to our culture, we uh, resisted assimilation as much as we could, and, um, and now here we are, and we're getting all these new freedoms. And uh, what are we going to do? Where does the future uh, uh, lead from here. And every tribe is different. Uh, some reservations uh, have tremendous uh, promise toward economic sustainability and independence. Uh, others, it's, it, it's a black hole. Uh, uh, stealing all my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've totally stolen from him this whole time. Uh, I stole his thunder with the whole movie reference thing and now um, uh, but uh, it, I personally, what I would like to see, and this is something that some reservations clearly articulated desire to do, but again, on, as we talked with some of you today, uh, try, just because tribes are on a reservation doesn't mean they have one mind or one voice. It's often a dozen different voices, all speaking in a different direction. Uh, and so uh, some tribes would like to be, uh, become more and more independent from the federal government and at some, time, and at some point achieve true sovereignty. Uh, my uncle tried to do that by declaring the Lakota a sovereign nation. Uh, it didn't work. Uh, <laughs> there's still a reservation. Uh, mostly because the actual tribal government said, uh, no we're not. Uh, why? Because they're a close relationship with the federal government. The federal government through treaty obligations has established a trust relationship with, with uh, tribes and that means uh, especially for the tribes that are economically really hard hit, uh, they get most of their sustenance from the federal government <coughs> in some way or another. Um, and so it's very hard to let go of that. But what I would like to see is every reservation be given its own independence. Uh, we would have, uh, I, you know, I don't know if you want to do it like Puerto Rico. I would prefer true independence. And we just have passports and driver's license on the reservations. and. I poll my students about that, and I never get very much support for that idea. I don't think America is anywhere near ready for something like that. Um, but I think it would be be the reason I want that is not just to stick it to the U.S. is because I think that's what would be best for Native Americans. 
I think Native American uh, tribes uh, need to eventually wean themselves away from that federal money. And I, and I think take grasp of their own independence and future. And to do that again as a sovereign nation as they used to be uh, would be tremendously just exciting for me. But I'm sure I'll be long dead before anything like that comes around. So. Dan Addison, who was the horse whisperer for the Arapaho Nation, um, recently passed away. He was really a wonderful man. And I wondered if on other Native American tribes, if they had their individual horse whisperers or animal communicators, or was Dan just pretty unique? Uh, the question is about um, horse whisperers or people who have special relationships with animals on reservations. Um, and again, that's it's so disparate for every different tribe. Uh, some tribes uh, go, I mean, er every tribe has a different way of knowing the world around it um, and having relationships with animals and how those play into everything. But uh, uh, some, you know, your closeness or ability to communicate or have a relationship with animals is usually based upon a dream, a vision, um, that it, it's a power animal of yours. It, you, in other words, you have a reciprocal obligation with that animal. You're going to provide something for them and then they're going to provide something for you. It's a partnership. Um, and that's a gift. As, as it's seen as a gift from God. So it's very rare. Uh, and uh, it, it is, you know, hit and miss. Uh, it, you know, it's, when someone passes away, that doesn't necessarily mean there's going to be somebody else. There's no apprentice si situation in that sense. So you might not have someone else fill that role for quite a while. Um, it's like that movie they made about the whale rider, I think it was, um, you know, which was, uh, I thought, a really good movie. But, um, you know, it, it's, I, I don't know of any specific ones at this moment. Uh, but having a close relationship with these animals is, uh, well, first of all, I don't know. You know that animals weren't seen as animals. They're, they're just a different people. They're just, they're, they're, they're just like us. It's just that they look different and talk different. Um, so... They weren't sanctified as, as Western culture from the Bible. When God sanctified us, he separated us from the animals and gave Adam the stewardship uh, over the animals. Uh, th that creates a very distinct separation. God has said, you are different. Um, these kinds of things. Well, they, don't, they, they, they didn't have that. So uh, their perception, uh, animals were powerful, dangerous. Uh, they could declare war on you. They could cause disease. Um, but if you could just harness their power and, and have a good relationship with them, then they could provide bounty for you, so such as horses and so on. Um, so uh, it's, it's a rare but wonderful thing when it does occur, but I, I, I don't know any specifics that I can tell you about. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, I think Dancers of Worlds, uh, they went to some effort to get things right. But your point really was that it was not really right because it was still relying on stereotypes. So my question to you, Professor Lee, is can Hollywood movies really tell complicated stories about Indian people? And if so, could you give us an example of one that does that? The best ones are the contemporary ones. Smoke signals, skins. Uh, that, those are real Indians right there, OK? Uh, doing it in a historical context is, is more difficult simply because it's harder. Um, and Dances with Wolves is just so rife with mistakes. I just, I want to scream. Um, the Lakota are just meeting white people. It's 1860s. They, you know, the Lakota have met Lewis and Clark 60 years ago. They know all about white people. They've been coming through on the Oregon Trail for 25 years. Uh, so to couch them in that is, is kind of ridiculous, um, where they don't know about guns and and these kinds of things. Uh, the army is the bad guy. When it wasn't the army that was the bad guy, it was the settlers that were usually the ones causing the trouble. Uh, the Pawnee, as these savage attackers of white people, the Pawnee were the best of friends with the uh, These kinds of things were, if anybody was going to kill Stands with the Fist's family and so on, it was going to be the Sioux, not the, <laughs> not the Pawnee. So um, anyway, that's my rant on Dances with Wolves. but. Uh, <coughs> They do get some things right as far as uh, the discussions among the, amongst the tribe and, and the relationships. And they, they make the Native Americans seem real and not caricatures of themselves. And I thought that was really well done. Uh, so I, I got to tip my hat to that. 
uh, the, the respect for the elders, the way the elders delegated authority. Um, my favorite scene is when that young man uh, says, you know, oh, that's beneath you. You shouldn't do that. He goes, I'm not. <laughs> you are. <laughs> you are. <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. So can they do it? Yes, but um, they're going to need to hire me for a lot of money. Uh, now, <laughs> they really want to have to do it. And the problem with that is sometimes Hollywood, you, you, the, you, it's driven by story. It's driven by plot. And, and you know, so you've got to come up with something really in, intuitive and in, ingenious to to get to that in a Native American context and, and, and sell tickets. And that's the, that's the rub. They could do it, but money if money's driving the ship, I, I, there's no motivation to really do it, unless I win the lottery. Or something and and, and maybe uh, just let me jump in and make a, a general comment about how I, I think it's really interesting how there's so much expertise in the world about so many things. You know, we know a lot of stuff. And, Every individual in here is probably an expert on something that they know better than anybody else in this room. And uh, I, I think it's really interesting to be able to ask this kind of question of, of every expert, you know, which, which movies get the stuff right, which get it wrong, which TV shows do you like, which, which get them wrong. And uh, we could, if that meme could kind of take off and we could just learn from each other, um, I think that would be awesome. That's a great idea. Yeah. <laughs> Jeff, um, what, probably other people didn't know the answer to this, but what is the status of the settlement with the government now about the, the mismanagement of, Indian, of Native American money? And I know, I think I've lost it somehow in the news, or is it they, sitting there? <laughs> no, they, it's, been, it's been settled uh, for a fraction of what the government uh, really should have paid, but uh, gosh, now the number in my head is $476 million, but um, that could be wrong. It's the Cobell case she's talking about where, you know, the federal government would make these treaties and give all this money to the tribes, but then they wouldn't actually give them the money. They would hold the money because Indians are childlike and simple. Um, and, yeah, they'd manage that. And you you're do all these annuities and so Well, where's all the money? All those accounts are dried up. They're all gone. Where'd it go? Uh, well, we know what happened. I mean, patronage and corruption, that's what used to run this country back in the period that I gave my lecture for, you know. I mean, you know, that's why the guy that started the whole wounded knee thing, Royer, uh, the, a the Indian agent, was a young man who had made political contributions and got the job as Indian agent because of that. And he was, they called it, the Indians on the reservation called him young man afraid of his Indians. Uh, because the guy was, uh, he, he was just petrified. And so he screamed loud enough and long enough that there was going to be an uprising, uh, even though everyone else was saying, no, there's not, until finally they sent the army in. And then you had the Wounded Knee Massacre. So, uh, you know, those monies are gone. I, they've settled it. It's, I, I, does anybody know? I think it's $476 million. Conservatively speaking, it's estimated into the trillions, though. Trillions of dollars were, were due, and they're gone. So I never got my cut. <laughs> yeah, I, I have about 50 questions for Susan, so I'm going to try to keep it down to two, okay? Um, they're sort of related. I was really um, intrigued as you were describing public art to think about what constitutes public art, because on the one hand, we were, you were talking about public art that's in public spaces, art that is provided to the public, art that the public somehow constructs, and, and then things that, that the public interact with. Right, and and I, so I'd like you to talk a little bit about the relationship between those aspects and whether things can become public art, like the Citco sign in Boston, that <laughs> they decided to hold on to these. They like it so much. Um, but the other side of this is, is a much more local question, which is to do with um, being killed. And I was really intrigued that there is a piece of art coming, although it's from someone outside Wyoming, so they do this lovely piece. Um, but I wonder if there's any public works, public art project in process that might um, do something with at least some of the, uh, the beetle kill. As we came across the mountains, there are massive trees out there now standing dead that are very usable, but I'm told they're only usable for about three years in terms of art and that kind of thing. So, so those, those two things would go together. It's a big question about what public art is. And then is there an opportunity for us to do some kind of public art for this moment that we'll never have again, and we'll never have those forests quite the same. 
opportunity or something happening at the moment. Okay, so the question has to do with public art. Um, we're back to what is it and why. Um, and if there's something that can be done with the <coughs> current situation of uh, beetle kill pine that, we, that we're um, dealing with. Um, I think one of the interesting things for me is I have begin to work more and more with this idea about art in public places um, is that I think it's really becoming clear that it's specific to a community. So I think the reason why it exists in certain places um, or, or the way it exists in certain places has to do with a reference to the community that it's in. The, the mural project is a case in point. Um, you know, they had a huge graffiti problem. They turned it into something that is just truly remarkable. Um, so I, I think for communities who are struggling, I know a lot of Wyoming communities are trying to put public art um, in our, in our um, towns and, and I know that there's a lot of, um, uh, there are many different ways to do that, but I don't think there's a formula and I don't think there's um, a one set standard kind of fits all. I think it, the part of making it a community project is that it's part, it's made by the community which has to do with identifying values and, and what the community is, what its history is, what's important about it, what you want to convey about your community, and then marrying that with a, with a community project that begins to make that visible. Um, I do think that in historically, when you look back, um, if you look at the two um, cities that I've mentioned briefly, um, the public art program in Philadelphia and the one in New York, the early ones, um, we really had situations that more like putting big sculpture in a place. I mean, we kind of call it plop art, you know, it's just kind of there. And there's not really a relationship to where it is necessarily, or it's not really obvious. And I think we've really, in the last 20 or 30 years, moved beyond that to where we're really trying to integrate art into environments um, and into situations so that it isn't just something like a statue. It becomes something that has more uh, the ability to interact with it, and you know whether you're walking through it. The Patrick Doherty piece that we had on campus, the the, um, the hut-like form on um, Prexies, was specifically placed and meant to be gone into, enjoyed. There was a, um, an aroma from the from the uh, material that he used that you know it became a more than just a visual experience. It was a it was an experiential experience to to do that. So I think, you know, I think public art can be a lot of things and I think that that's um, part of what the challenge is with it. Um, it isn't just buying a piece of art and putting it somewhere, it's really thinking about context and purpose and looking at a vision to make a community m more visible in that way. Um, the pine beetle issue, it's been interesting for us to work through even bringing that material onto campus because the, um, they will not, you have, to you have to strip the bark from it um, because that's where the beetle larvae or whatever is gonna hatch some time later um, still exists and you don't, want it, you don't want to infest a town now that it's already infested the surrounding mountains. So, um, so we've been working with physical plant to, um, and the Forest Service about even how to get the wood that we need for Chris to do the piece. I, I think Chris thought, well, you know, there's all that dead wood out there. Can't you just go harvest it and get some, you know? And, um, and the answer to that was no. And so we've been working through, um, you know, various people to try and get the material that we need. So I don't, I don't know about a, you know, I, I know there's, I've talked to folks who've been interested in building their homes out of it. Um, you know, standing dead um, wood can be really gorgeous when it's used in furniture or in homes, but I think the same issue is there. You know, we don't want to create something that's going to be a bigger problem later. <laughs> so, and, and so I don't, and I don't know of anybody who's um, actively trying to do something with that at this point. Okay, we're coming up on about one thirty, which is which is when we close. <coughs> Any last question, perhaps, before we call an end to our term <laughs> and our year? Okay. Well, thank you very much for coming.